So the specific circumstances was one day he was found uh, hitchhiking in New Jersey and he was picked up for vacancy by the police and said that he was drunk, etc. And they called the office of the man who was my father's um, manager at the time and he said, he's not drunk, he's sick. And they took him to Greystone Hospital for observation. And that's how he landed there in the first place and then ended up spending many, many years there. So then what happened after he arrived? How did the staff, professional staff and otherwise, regard him and work with him? Well, he was uh, just a typical patient. He wasn't, um, quote unquote, Woody Guthrie at mm -hmm. the time. He was considered a kind of drunken guy they found on the New Jersey Turnpike. <laughs> and, um, and I remember reading some of the original transcripts from his admittance. And it's just very typical, like found, you know, incoherent or possibly this interview. He says this. He says his name is Woody Guthrie and that he's a folk singer, but we don't know whether to believe him because he could be schizophrenic. And it's just kind of all this like early interview kind of stuff they do um, in the entrance place of the hospital. And also, again, a lot of confusion about what he was saying and where to put him. And, and again, it's a psychiatric hospital. You have to remember this. And so everything that's coming out of his mouth when he says that he's a writer they're going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I think in the in the um, entrance papers it says that he has illusions of grandeur, actually, in the papers. So it was kind of messed up, you know. And uh, then they began doing a number of different kinds of tests, et cetera. And so when did it become evident that he was Woody Guthrie and? Had an impressive well, set even of you know, and... it became my the manager went and cleared things up and said he actually is a writer. At that point, he wasn't really as well known as a folk singer writer as well as he had published Bound for Glory, his autobiography, in 1943, and that was a kind of a big hit for him, so to speak. And I don't mean that it sold a lot of books, but it was well received by the critics and by other writers as being a very um, novel piece of writing for the time. It kind of predated Jack Kerouac's On the Road. And there's been, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of thoughts that Kerouac, in reading Bound for Glory, kind of inspired him to write On the Road to what extent that's true or not, I don't know, but they're very similar in their styles of writing. And so, unless you happen to have read and you were in that, you know, reading the New York Times book review, <laughs> he was kind of still a drunk guy found on the New Jersey Turnpike, <laughs> you know. So it, it wasn't until, I remember um, my brother Arlo tells a very funny story about someone, come, some another uh, inmate at the hospital coming up to him and saying, oh, you're Woody Guthrie, I, I loved your book. And Woody answers, I, oh, you read my book? He said, no, I ate your book. <laughs> <laughs> so that's as, that's as famous as we were at the time. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that is the story that goes around in the family. Okay. And um, later on, Woody, he did stay there for a good number of years and Part of your answer in that is that as he was acknowledged as a folk singer later on, he would, people would start bringing records to the hospital and saying, oh yeah, this is him on record. And they went, oh, they would play it on the loudspeakers in his ward. So no one had researched really what were those years like in the hospitals. So that was a total mind blower for me to find all these writings that had happened. And what were they about? They were about nurses in the hospital. They were about patients in the hospital. They were about his day, what he did in the day. 
He talks about helping to clean up the ward. Because again, he's not a psychiatric patient. He was put into Greystone because there was no place else for him to go. We can talk more about that later. But So he's writing about, I tried to help uh, serve all the, the trays of food when they put out. I tried to help sweep up. I loaded up the chairs. I piled them up in the rec room. So he's describing his daily life, trying to keep himself busy and volunteering for lots of different things in the hospital. So his what he left us in his writings from the hospital is very, very interesting and significant and hasn't been kind of fully exposed as yet. A lot of writings about uh, lyrics about spirituality, about understanding what illness is, a coming, coming death might be like, what life is like. So it kind of gets really interesting, actually. After a few times, again, as my father was getting worse, he was in a big ward with about, I don't know, 30 other patients. And he was at the end of the ward, so we had to walk through this whole psychiatric ward to get to, get to him. And it was really scary. And I didn't like, it was just horrible. I didn't like it at all. And I, I remember this feeling of hiding behind my mother's skirt, like we were three ducks in a row walking down like, <laughs> looking, you know, ho hoping every people jumping around and or making strange sounds. Very scary place, actually. And then she said, well, let's all meet outside. So there was a big tree right outside the ward, and it was a, a weeping beech tree, something like that. And my father called it the magic -y tree. There's the ending instead of the magic tree. It was the magic -y tree. And we would play under that like monkeys climbing all over the tree and my father would come out and my mother would make a picnic and we would play around the tree and goof around so that was better we didn't have to be in the ward people started coming out to our house a lot of musicians and his friends they would they would call it a hoot nanny at the time and they would come out and bring their instruments and play music for him all day with him. Did he appreciate that? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, he really liked that. And did they play his music or the music? Well, the joke was that um, <laughs> that sometimes the younger ones would come and say, I'm gonna, Woody Guthrie, I have a new song, would you like to hear it? And he'd go, no, <laughs> but not really. <laughs> so. He loved when people played his songs. I mean, at that point, through because of Dylan, a lot of his songs started to get more well-known. Previously, in the small folk circle, that we, which was like 30 people <laughs> in New York or whatever, um, but through Dylan, you know, songs like Pastures of Plenty and 1930 Massacre, Hard Traveling, um, all the Dust Bowl songs, the young people started singing them. So you would get young people coming to the house and saying, I want to be a songwriter just like you. You want to hear my new song? And he go, no. And even Dylan says he called himself a Woody Guthrie jukebox. He said that's what Woody wanted to hear. He wanted to hear all the young people singing his songs, which, of course, when you think about it, when you're going, you want to make sure that someone knows what you've done with your life. So it was very deeply meaningful to him to have young people singing Pastures of Plenty, Grand Coulee Dam, all these songs that he had spent his life writing and actually hadn't even uh, recorded or released a lot of them up at that point in the 50s and early 60s. The, the Ash recordings didn't come out until later. The only records that were out were Dust Bowl Ballads, which was 11 songs. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and one or two other songs that the people had heard in concert or on radio. But the bulk of his material wasn't released until the, the 60s already, when Smithsonian Folkways took over. Did he ever, when uh, other people were playing his music, like correct them or stop them, say it's not how well, it should be? <laughs> Arlo. <laughs> Arlo tells a couple of funny stories how he learned some of the songs and and my father would say well there's more to it than that 
And that's the, one of Arla's best stories is with This Land is Your Land. He, he learned the first three verses. And then my father said, well, there's three more that they don't teach you in school. So he, would te he taught them the last three verses of that, which is the way Arlo sang it from that day on. You know, include the, some of the verses about no trespassing, Freedom Highway, things like that. And the relief offices by the shadow of the steeple, I saw my people by the relief office. I stood there wondering, is this land made for you and me? So Arlo was very excited to be one of the first people to bring the all of the verses to light. Mm -hmm.